Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Assura PRC Interim Results Investor Presentation. Throughout this presentation, investors will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged and can be submitted at any time using the Q&A tab on the right-hand corner of your screen. Just please simply type in your question at any time and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question received during today's meeting. However, the company will review all questions submitted today and publish responses where it's appropriate to do so. We'll make these available to you via the Investor Meet Company dashboard and we'll notify you when they're ready for your review. I'd also like to remind you that this presentation is being recorded. Before we begin, we would like to submit the following poll. And if you would give that to your kind attention, we would be very grateful. And I'd now like to hand over to Jane Cottam, CFO, and Jonathan Murphy, CEO from Ashura. Good afternoon to you both. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for this afternoon's presentation. So, uh, so my name is Jonathan Murphy. I'm the CEO from Assura. So I'll begin by giving you a brief overview of our performance in the first half. I'll then pass over to Jane, and she'll take you through some of the key financials, uh, as well as giving you a brief strategy update. Uh, and then I'll come back and give you a little bit more context to what we're seeing in the market at the moment, uh, market trends and developments, uh, and also a little bit more about our, our outlook. Uh, for the year ahead. So turning first to the highlights from the first six months of the year, um, we've had a very busy period. I'm sure you've all seen lots of press coverage about the impact of COVID and the, the, the seismic changes that there have been in, in the health market as a result, uh, the backlog in services, uh, the need for more capacity in our hospitals. This has all been uh, accelerating trends that we're already very well aware of, uh, and it's very much playing to our core capability, which is delivering capacity for the NHS in out of hospital care. So we're a leading developer. We've created a, a market position where we are the number one developer with the largest pipeline and the strongest team in the sector. And that means we're the best place company to support the NHS and partner with the NHS in terms of delivering this all important capacity that the system so badly needs. That will be reflected in our very strong outlook in terms of pipelines. We'll go through these in some detail coming up, but we've got a very strong acquisition pipeline. And also our development pipeline is now reaching levels that we have never seen before. So getting close to 500 million. And all of these uh, increases in the size of our operations and our prospective growth all around driving you know, superior returns for our investors as we generate uh, and increase the scale of the business we're able to generate scale benefits, and that's driving uh, the growth in returns and therefore dividends. So in terms of the impact of COVID, I've already referenced some of these. There's been a, a massive backlog in terms of services. A waiting list have hit levels, frankly, that the country's never seen before. You've probably read headlines about the increased health inequalities, ability to access healthcare, you know, and how that, that diverges around the country. And our hospitals are really struggling for capacity. You know, our beds are being used for COVID patients and COVID protocols mean there's a reduced capacity in the hospital system. So, of course, what we need to address that is to provide extra capacity in the primary care space. Now, unfortunately, the vast majority of medical centres in the UK can't do this. They are converted residential properties that could be even 100 years old in many cases. And this is highlighting the urgent need for quality fit for purpose, modern spaces to provide that capacity that the NHS so greatly needs. And where do we fit into all this? Well, we, we've got the, the best in class uh, capability in our development team, which means that we have the skills, we've got the capital, and we've got the ability to deliver and respond to those challenges. So we're looking to increase the number of schemes that we're working on, looking at uh, across a range of, of asset types, uh, and also investing heavily in our design, innovation and sustainability, because that's absolutely fundamental to helping the NHS in achieving its net zero carbon goals. So how do we do our business? So social impact and sustainability are absolutely at the heart of what Assure is all about. So we place this in, at the centre of our decision making, the way we run our business and also the way we deliver our buildings. So there are two key elements to this. Uh, six by six strategy covers both social impact and sustainability. So firstly, on the social impact side. Last year, we created the Assura Community Fund. This is a charitable organisation and we seeded this with two and a half million pounds donation. And this supports health and wellness activities linked to our buildings. Just last week, we signed off £400,000 worth of grants going to causes right across the country, 
supporting health and wellness activities uh, for, linked, linked to our buildings. The other thing is working with our supply chain to make sure that we are driving as much sustainable activity as possible and also looking to support local skills and education needs wherever possible. And on the sustainability side, we've set ourselves a target of achieving an EPC of B or better in five years. That's well ahead of the government uh, deadline of 2030. We've set a target of 2026. On new builds, we've said for new developments, we're going to, we've got a target for 2026 of delivering the UK's first net zero carbon um, medical centre. Now that includes the embodied carbon in the construction process as well. A very challenging an ambitious goal, but one that we're fully committed to. And lastly, we're committed to sourcing all of our energy through renewable sources. These commitments are absolutely fundamental to the way we do business and also in terms of supporting our major customer. We strongly believe that our six by six strategy is the right thing to do. It also aligns us with the values and the purpose of the NHS, which means ultimately it will support our commercial success as well. Now, I'll pass over to Jane to take you through some of the key financials. Jane. Thank you, Jonathan. So I'm Jane Cottam. I'm the CFO. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everybody. I'm going to give you a few highlights on the finance update for the interim results and then take you through our, our development strategy. So um, if, if we look at the figures there, our net rental income is up 12% year on year. We're now at uh, just over £61 million pounds which has led to our adjusted EPRA earnings increasing by 14% to £40.9 million. At an earnings per share level, we've seen an increase of 7% year on year, and we're now at one and a half pence. And we uh, aim to pass on the majority of our earnings growth to our shareholders, and we announced an increase in the dividend uh, back in June. And year on year, we have increased the dividend by 4%. And uh, we will announce any further dividend increases uh, at the year end. If we look at our portfolio, our, our investment property portfolio is now £2.6 billion, and that's up 6% since March. Um, we have had some yield compression, so we have had valuation growth of uh, 20, uh, valuation increase of £28 million, and we've also seen two basis points movement in our net initial yield to 4.56%. Our EPRA net tangible asset per share has increased by 2% in the period to 58.4 pence and our loan to value at the half year was 39% um, which will reduce uh, following the successful placing yesterday. So these charts just highlight our portfolio growth. So on the left, you can see we've increased the portfolio by one and a half billion since March 2016. And on the right, you can see where our rental growth has come from. So if we look at our rent roll, it's gone from um, 121 million to 127 and a half million. And that's come from a range of activities across the business. So we, we did a few disposals in the period. Uh, we got one million from our from our rent reviews. 1.3 million is from completions within our development pipeline and the majority are from our acquisition program of four and a half uh, at four and a half million. Our additions in the period were 170 million pounds. That's across developments and acquisitions. So what this slide is highlighting is the growth in our portfolio since 2018. So in four and a half years, we've added 1.1 billion pounds to our portfolio. The majority has been acquisition led at just over 900 million, but we've added 185 million of completed developments. And all of those are at very attractive yields on cost. Uh, in the last half, it's at 4.9%. And you can see the weighted average unexpired lease term on these additions is also very favourable at 16 years in the last six months. And as a comparison, our portfolio, as I've said, the net initial yield is 4.56% and our weighted average unexpired lease term across the portfolio is 11.7 years. So what this slide is showing you is... Um, how we have taken our strategy around our debt and how that compares 
to uh, our net initial yield. So the top line is showing the compression of our yields from 5.56% in 2015 down to 4.56% uh, at the last valuation. But in 2015, we took the decision to have a look at our balance sheet and how we structure our debt. And we decided to move from secured uh, lending to an unsecured uh, portfolio of debt. We completed all of that last year, but three years ago, we, we received an A minus rating from Fitch, and that allowed us to access the public bond markets. So we have private placements, we have our bank run, revolving credit facility, and we also have uh, the bonds. Um, our last bond in June was at 1.625% for 12 year money. And our weighted average maturity on our debt has increased from eight to eight and a half years. We raised our first sustainable bond in June following the successful social bond uh, the previous year. Both of these transactions were heavily oversubscribed. The margin on our debt um, was uh, considerably reduced from 128 basis points last summer, which we thought was fantastic, moving forward to 85 basis points uh, this year. And that just shows you the strength of the business, the A minus rating, and the fact that we are raising our finance uh, in line with our sustainability strategy is proving incredibly beneficial. And that gap between our net initial yield and our cost of debt, we, we are hoping to maintain moving forward. This just gives a little bit more colour in terms of our history around our loan to value and our interest uh, interest rates. Um, in terms of our loan to value, our guidance remains unchanged. We can go up to 50 percent. However, um, that would only be in exceptional circumstances. Uh, we remain comfortable in and around 40 percent. We're happy to go above 40 percent, but we would expect to bring it down over time. So just looking at our development strategy, um, in March 2017, we had a development team of two people and we had a total development pipeline of £122 million. We took that decision at that time that we really wanted to focus. We could see that uh, 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 the quality of the uh, estate, primary care estate, uh, needs significant investment across the, across the UK. There is support for better primary care facilities. And we started to gain some traction in the amount of approvals we were getting for new developments. Therefore, we strengthened that team. And in the last couple of years, we have acquired a couple of developers, uh, Matrix, GPI, and uh, this year we acquired Apollo. So we now have a team of 10 development managers and surveyors, and we have a record pipeline of developments of £480 million, pounds, which is the best in our history. And as I've already said, we've completed £185 million pounds worth of developments since April 2017. And the buildings on the photographs just underneath there on, on the right are just examples of the buildings we've completed in the last 18 months alone. We're really starting to see this strategy pay off for us as we're seeing record number of inquiries and the team are settling in and, and answering those and growing our development pipeline and capabilities. And this chart just gives you uh, an example of uh, shows you how far we've come since March 2015 with less than 100 million in our pipeline. And you can see they're going all the way up uh, to today at 480 million. We've got 12 schemes on site for 72 million pounds and our immediate pipeline of 145 million is for 20 schemes. Those schemes are expected to be on site within the next 12 months. So you can see the development team are going to be particularly busy over the next 12 months. And schemes in our extended pipeline, £263 million for 37 schemes. These are where we are the approved partner and we are going through the various NHS approval processes and planning, etc. And therefore, completion on those average building is in between 14 and 18 months. So uh, you're looking at four or five years before they're actually completed. So what are the benefits of development to us? Why don't we just stick to acquisitions and continue to acquire in the open market? Well, as you can see, we've got an access, access to a, a really healthy pipeline. These are the highest quality assets in our market. We have 21 year uh, lease lengths. We have no rent freeze, no breaks, and they are the highest quality assets. 
We can capture the development margin and these are relatively low risk. There's no speculative development. We don't buy land in advance. We take options on land and we only start on site when we have a signed agreement for lease. About half of our pipeline of forward funds where we will capture around 15, 10 to 15 basis points betterment on, uh, on the open market yield on those assets. But if we develop them in house, which is around half of our pipeline, we can capture up to uh, 100 basis points betterment on that yield. We talk about rents being set relative to construction costs because we operate on a cost plus basis where we speak to the NHS, we show them what the building costs us and they apply a yield. If there is construction cost inflation, then by definition, the rent will go up. And this provides a point of evidence, a new high watermark for rents in the particular area of that building. And therefore, we can gain rent reviews on our existing portfolio and drive rental growth. Having these direct conversations with the NHS um, is helping to drive adjacent opportunities, which Jonathan will come on to. But it's incredibly important to have these relationships with the NHS, with the doctors directly, uh, because we're definitely seeing uh, further opportunities for us moving forward. And everything that we do with our development supports our commitment to our innovation and sustainability. Uh, as Jonathan talked about our six by six, what we're what we're able to do with our buildings, because we've got so many on site, we're allowed to pick a couple uh, to sample and trial new technology, new innovation and new sustainability, which will then set the tone for the buildings of the future. And that is very important. So just to cap in terms of the, the first half, we've had continued growth at 117 million of our acquisitions uh, and, and developments. We have maintained our capital discipline. We have raised sustainable financing at fantastic uh, industry leading rate of 1.625%. And the strategic focus on our development is paying off as we see that pipeline continue to grow and the number of inquiries increasing. Back to you, Jonathan. Thanks, Jane. So hopefully that gives you a good overview of our performance for the first half of the year. So what I'd like now like to do is have a look more at the pros prospects of the business and what we see uh, coming down the pipe. So one of the key areas for, for future potential growth is to do with organic growth, and that's to do with our ability to grow our rent roll and increase our rents across our portfolio. So Jane has already explained how this mechanism works. And if you look at our performance in the first half, we achieved an overall uh, level of, of rental growth of 2.1%. And that was one of the significant contributors to the valuation gain of 28 million that Jane spoke about earlier. That linkage to construction cost inflation obviously means that in the current environment, I'm sure you've all read headlines about increased costs, disruptions to supply chains, some of that. So an obvious question is, is that starting to come through in higher rents? Well, the short answer is yes. We are seeing increased costs, and therefore, as a result, we're able to negotiate higher rents with the NHS. The cautionary note, though, is that each of these is negotiated on a site-by-site -site basis, and therefore, we need to have a development in that location to enable to drive rents in that location. So it's inevitably going to take some time uh, to come through. In terms of the market, we continue to see very strong demand for our assets. So if you think about the nature of our, of our sector, you've got very long leases, you've got a very secure covenant, effectively, you've got an NHS backing, um, you've got a tenant that's very unlikely to, to relocate. So you've got very predictable and very steady returns. And I think that's reflected in the relative attractiveness for the sector. And I'm sure you're not surprised to hear that we continue to see real competition for any assets that come onto the market. Uh, there's ourselves, there's PHP, and there's BlackRock, the large US investor. All three of us are active right across the board. Uh, and if any assets are actively marketed, then the three of us will be in a competitive bidding process. So inevitably, this leads to, um, to competition and you, you're inevitably going to result in slightly higher prices. So in the first half, we saw um, a relatively modest uptick in the yield, two basis points, but that was part of the factor that drove the valuation game that, that Jane was talking about. Now, we always get asked about what the outlook is for, for, um, for, for our yields. 
and it's 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 always one that is almost impossible to answer. So if we look ahead, you know, we can see transactions you know that are still in the that are happening in the market right now, and that gives us confidence that we can't really see any reason for prices to come down. Uh, but equally, it's very hard to give us a firm prediction to uh, investors about about the likelihood or the potential scale of any uh, of any valuation uplift. But I think one of the key things from this slide is if you have a look at the, at the performance over the last 15 years, it's a picture of real stability, gradual movements, and that should give investors some comfort as to the sustainability of the current levels. In terms of key trends we're seeing, I mean, Assure is all about trying to understand where the market is going and seeing whether we can get ahead of those trends and respond for our customers. So if, if we take the four key trends I've highlighted here, uh, each, each in turn. So the first one is about the demand for face-to-face -face appointments. So you'll have read all the headlines in the papers about um, the lack of ability to see your GP, how uh, you can't get a face-to-face -face appointment, that people are being forced to have digital consultations against their will. There's been a lot of quite emotive language used in this area. But I think the key thing here is you know, we definitely have seen a shift so pre-COVID, it was almost in, almost always a face-to-face -face consultation. Post-COVID, we're seeing 40 to 50% of consultations now being done over the telephone or online. Very difficult to see that dramatically changing anytime soon, though there's definitely a demand and pressure to increase that face-to-face -face, uh, ratio again. This idea of a kind of a mixed economy and a mixed delivery model, I think, is, is what we're likely to see. So we're already working with our customers to understand exactly what that might mean going forward and to make sure that we're adapting our buildings to make them as, uh, as flexible as possible so they can respond to those trends. Another trend we've seen is an increasing requirement for mental health services. So the backlog in services for elective surgery, for NHS treatments, that's all over the, the press pretty much on a daily basis. But actually, the pressures on the mental health system, that doesn't get the same level of press coverage, but it's no less real. There's a real backlog on uh, counselling services and mental health treatments as well. And this requires high quality space to deliver it. The third one is in terms of net zero carbon. So clearly, today is the last day of, of COP26. Uh, yesterday uh, was the Built Environment Day for COP26. In fact, we were one of the uh, sponsors of the BPF's virtual pavilion, uh, which was highlighting and showcasing some of the best examples of how real estate is rising to the challenge and trying to meet the challenges of sustainability. The NHS is really committed to this. Um, they, they've set themselves a target of being the, um, the, the, the first, um, the, a global target of being the world's first net zero carbon health system. Clearly, we need to play our part uh, to support them in that, and that's exactly what we're doing by supporting our, our sustainability objectives, working on our new build uh, targets of a net zero carbon, but also improving the performance of our current building with, you know, for example, we've got 30 uh, improvement projects for our EPCs going out um, over the next few weeks. The last key element that we're highlighting here is, is the age old debate about how we're going to pay for this increased demand of healthcare. It's really notable that this government has been um, really keen to highlight that it is funding the NHS at, at, at record levels. It's, it's committed to continuing to increase the level of funding, both in a general basis and also to have a look at um, to have a look at specific areas as well. So there was specific funding in the budget for diagnostics and there was specific funding in the budget for surgical hubs, as well as a significant increase in the overall funding level for the NHS. So a very clear statement of intent from this government that they see the NHS as a real priority and as, and as an area where politically they think there's votes to be got from investing more money in the NHS, which is very reassuring for the future funding outlook. So how does all that relate to us? So what we've done is we've, we've analysed and addressed, looked at these trends and thought, well, what do we need to do to respond to some of these challenges that the NHS is seeing? Well, how do we need to perhaps you know, behave in a slightly different way or respond to, to some of these? So the first one here is about that move to um, supporting diagnostics and trust. So this is more uh, you know, different types of capacity, different types of buildings that can be delivered still for the NHS, but they wouldn't have any GPs in them. So a little bit different to our current current infrastructure, but fundamentally a very similar building. 
So you can see there, there's a picture there. That's a building in the northeast of England. Uh, that's a scheme that's currently in for planning that we hope we hope to get approval for any day. Uh, and subject, subject to that, we're hoping to get on site early next year. It will be a clinical facility. It will be a training facility. And also it will have uh, capacity for, for primary care. You know, essential capacity for that for that NHS trust in that region supporting the delivery of services in that locality. The next one is mental health. So I've just mentioned that there's a backlog in services. And one of the key issues here is that the quality of the estate is extremely poor. So what we have to do is, is what, we, what we've been doing is talking to the NHS about whether there is a need for further investment in these types of assets. So far, it's very early days. We've acquired two assets, but the conversations would seem to point that there's significant demand and desire for a professional landlord developer such as ourselves to support the NHS in this area. The third one on the slide is primary care at scale. So the traditional model for primary care is an individual practice and it's run like a small business. It is a small business. It's run independently. It's got its own back office. It hires and fires independently. It sources its own HR, its own training, its own IT, all completely standalone. So there's this increasing trend for practices to come together to collaborate. So the advantage here is they can share back office costs, but also they can pool resources. So the doctors can share shifts across the different premises. They can choose who works weekends, who works evenings, etc. And that's much easier to manage with a larger workforce. This presents a big opportunity for sure, because we could now potentially talk to partners who rather than just owning one building could potentially own 20 buildings or 30 buildings. There are two large players in this space, and I'm pleased to say that we've, we, we're working with both of them on their estate and how we can help them going forward. And the last one on the slide is an example of a private healthcare provision. So this is for Ramsey Healthcare, the Australian uh, healthcare operator. And this is a specific example of a uh, orthopedic uh, day case unit that we delivered for them in the Midlands. So this is a it's, it's a private business, Ramsey, an Australian private listed business running that facility. But actually what they're doing is they're providing services to the NHS. So the vast majority of their income comes from referrals from the NHS with a very small element of private pay. So just another example of another way of trying to meet the capacity constraints of the NHS. And frankly, to clear the current backlog, we're gonna to have to have a partnership between the public and private sectors to address those challenges. So in terms of what we've got looking forward, we've got a very strong pipeline at the moment. So we've got 102 million pounds in acquisitions there in the, in the center of the chart. Um, this is a uh, we will have those uh, monies deployed within within six months. Three to six months is the typical time for us to to uh, make that complete those deals. And on the left there, you can see the development pipeline that Jane has already spoken about. 72 million on site, 145 million in the immediate pipeline and 263 in the extended. So getting us to that all time high level of 480 million. And then thirdly on the chart is our asset enhancement activity. This is really essential work, you know, driving rent reviews, physical extensions, agreeing lease extensions, really important, valuable work that drives the valuations for our assets. Uh, and there's a significant pipeline of activity that we're looking to deliver on this area as well. So what does all that mean for our, for our prospective growth? Well, this chart essentially illustrates that if we do everything that I've just referred to in our pipeline, what would it mean for our income level? Well, you can see here it would take us from uh, just over 127 and a half million up to almost 160 million uh, as we build out and complete those projects. Now, those will take place over many years. So this isn't a this isn't a short term, uh, uh, short term illustration, but this is an indication of how much growth there is in the business today based on known projects and known activity levels. So if we look back on our first half, we reflect on a very busy first half and excellent progress across the board, across acquisitions, across developments, but also across uh, across our asset enhancement. We're also continuing to embed our six by six emphasis. This is our social impact and sustainability strategy. This is about doing the right thing. And it's also about going about business in a fundamentally different way. It's, it's a long term project and it's one we're fully committed to. And we've made some excellent progress in the first half. Thirdly, it's about responding to the requirements of our customer, the NHS, and the challenges and challenges and threats that COVID has, has, has caused, and us responding to that urgent need for additional capacity in the community.
So overall, it's been a very successful first half. We've continued to deliver significant growth. And as Jane has highlighted, uh, referenced the 7% the growth in our earnings in the first half. And we look forward to the second half of the year and beyond with confidence and optimism. That's great. Uh, Jonathan, Jane, thank you very much indeed for updating investors this afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, please do continue to submit your questions using the Q&A tab on the right-hand corner of your screen. But just while the company take a few moments to review investor questions submitted during today's call, I'd like to remind you the recording of this presentation, along with a copy of the slides and the published Q&A, can be accessed via your InvestorMeet company dashboard. I'd also like to remind you that your feedback is important to the company, and immediately after this presentation has ended, we'll redirect you in order that you can provide the company with your views and expectations. Um, Jonathan, Jane, obviously investors have submitted a number of questions. Um, hopefully you can see those in the Q&A tab on the right-hand side of your screen. If I could just hand back to you and ask you to read out the question and give a response where it's appropriate to do so, and I'll pick up from you afterwards. Great, thank you. So uh, thank you for a very full list of questions. Do please keep uh, submitting them. We will do our best to, uh, to respond uh, to all of them, uh, and, and we'll get through as many as we possibly can in the time. So the first question is from Krishna, and it says, could we provide some more details um, about yesterday's equity raise? It's a really good question. So um, this presentation is our interim results presentation. And then simultaneously with this yesterday, we announced a fundraise. Now, because the one came before the other, we haven't referenced it in this in any of these slides. So what we what we have um, completed is a um, uh, gross proceeds of 182 million pounds have been raised uh, from investors. So a wide range of investors, both institutional and private. Uh, we had a very positive and strong response uh, from our shareholders, uh, both existing and new. Uh, and we've now been able to secure additional funding, which takes our loan to value ratio now down to 31 percent, which gives us significant capacity to deliver on some of these growth plans that I've highlighted and some of these more medium and long term uh, opportunities. So delighted with the success of the of the raise. Uh, we'll receive the, the capital next week. We've got a very strong uh, use of proceeds uh, agenda. We've highlighted those pipelines, the acquisition pipeline that will be delivered within six months. That's 102 million. Then we're on site with 72 million for developments. And then our immediate pipeline will also be invested in that time period. And then we have our asset enhancement projects. So we've got a lot of activity to support and deploy the capital that we've raised. And, and we're really pleased with the, uh, with the success we had yesterday. So the next question is from Nick, and it's uh, about how do you find and assess new locations for suitability? Um, so yeah, really good question. So essentially what we do is um, we'll have an ongoing conversation and dialogue with the, with the local doctors. So we'll know, for example, uh, through, through, through our regular interactions that there might be um, the, the, the picture that I've got here on the slide is in Hereford. So let's take that as an example. So in Hereford, this scheme is one we've been working on for a number of years. So we will have started the conversation with the doctors, identified that, frankly, their current premises were not, not suitable, were not up for what they were trying to achieve. We'll have a conversation about their ambition. Would they be interested in a new building? You know, how big would that have to be? What sort of additional services would they, would they be interested in providing? And we'll do an initial assessment as to, to the viability and feasibility of that in that location. So we'll then then talk to the local NHS team and make sure that there is a there's a need and a, and a commitment from that local team to support additional investment in that locality. Now, if there is, we will then work with the doctors to build up the detailed plan. So that will be you know, the design, uh, the clinical case, the business case and all the other elements that go around it. And once we've got approval from the NHS in principle, we will then work to identify a suitable site. Now, that's really crucial because people don't like to, to move doctors and they certainly don't like their doctor to physically be a long way away. So you're quite narrow, actually, in terms of your geography of where you're able to look at. But we'll look for available sites. Very fortunate that we are we are delivering health infrastructure. It's it's a really it's a big net positive contributor to the community. So we very rarely get negative feedback from communities about us citing a medical center next to them or in, the, in, in their community. So that means we can often use quite difficult sites or, or, or sensitive sites in some ways, and even sometimes build on, on Greenbelt, for example. Uh, that, that, can, that can often be the answer. It's not our preferred answer, but it can, it, can, it can be the solution sometimes. So hopefully that gives you a, a bit of an indication as to how we go about um, selecting our sites. 
Thank you. So the next question is from Matthew, um, and it is, uh, with only a two basis points improvement in net initial yield during the period, is this a sign that yields are as sharp as they will get? Uh, good question, Matthew. So, I mean, I referenced in the presentation a little bit about the outlook, um, and I was being very careful not to give you a precise, you know, give you a forecast because we don't we don't issue forecasts. Um, and I, but I was also trying to get across that we still see a really competitive market here. So it's difficult. I think probably what you're really saying there is, are we calling the top of the market? And I would I, it's very difficult to make that statement at the moment. We're still seeing a lot of activity, uh, a lot of competitiveness around around bids. Um, and so clearly there's got to be further potential um, for, for, for price increases and yields to come in a little bit further. How much? It's almost impossible to say. Okay, there's another question uh, from Matthew, um, and on this one I might ask Jane to uh, to come in and, and talk about this, which is, as the pipeline grows, how does the yield on cost change? Thanks, Jonathan. Um, in terms of the uh, uh, in terms of the pipeline, uh, if we're looking at our development pipeline, and that has increased significantly. Um, the yield on cost doesn't change, other than the fact of uh, some of them being uh, uh, in-house developments and some of them being forward fund uh, developments. If you actually look at our additions overall in the first half, we uh, we added those to the portfolio at 4.9%. That was a particularly strong first half. We um, we acquired some of those assets, or rather, we started negotiating on some of those assets a, a little while ago, and so we uh, we uh, were probably pricing a couple of those at, at prices from 12, 18 months ago. Um, as Jonathan said, we don't give forecasts, but if we look at our pipelines, our, our net initial yield on our portfolio is probably a good barometer and, and benchmark in terms of. Of, of where yields generally are on on uh, on our additions, um, uh, but it all depends on on the actual asset. It also depends on whether we source it in house or or whether we uh, go through agents. As Jonathan said, it's very competitive, so sometimes those those yields can be can be a, a lot keener. But we also have this database of of all uh, practices and medical centres in the UK, and we can actually through our brand, our reputation, our connections, we can t uh, source around half of our assets off market. And therefore, we can generate uh, a, a slightly higher yields on those, which uh, which is obviously beneficial for us. And if you go back to the slide in the deck where we added 1.1 billion of additions over the last four and a half year, years, you can get an idea then in terms of uh, what we're acquiring at and also the weighted average and expired lease term on those. And, and, and we've done a very good job and we, we, uh, we will remain doing so going forward. Thanks, Jane. That's that's very helpful. So, just turning on to the next question, that's from Eduardo. Uh, actually, there's there's there's, a, there's quite a lot of questions. About ten questions in in this one. Um, there are lots of other people with questions coming up. So, what I'll do is I'll just I'll I'll just take a couple from this to start with, and then if we've got time, we'll we'll come back if that's okay. So, so the first question is, um, can you elaborate on how the development process works for private operators? How do these deals come about and what, how do you underwrite rental levels and, and returns on those? So, um, so Ramsey is a really interesting one. So uh, they were tenants of ours in, in a building uh, up, up in Middlesbrough. That was our, uh, and they provided uh, surgical care from, from within our, our, our building. This had primary care on two floors and then had a surgical floor Half of it led to the NHS, half of it led to Ramsey. Okay. The Ramsey side was phenomenally successful. They needed additional capacity. So they approached us about delivering, uh, finding them some additional space. So we built them a purpose-built center just uh, within a mile of, the, of that location. And hence that started that, started that relationship. Um, there's a, a, local, uh, a local developer um, that was also closely involved and we've continued that relationship ever since. So it's essentially built on uh, a track record, uh, built mutual trust between the parties, and we've delivered uh, successful projects for them, and they're very happy, therefore, to bring future projects to us. So that's essentially how it works. It's not a complicated um, process that we, we, we've worked well together, so they so they come back to us for, for future opportunities. We've got uh, we've just completed one this year. We're hoping to start on site with them uh, shortly on a further. And, and really interestingly, they're quite ambitious for further growth. So there might be another two or three schemes potentially for us. Uh, private sector is, is now running at about 5% of our rent roll. It's unlikely to get materially bigger than that, but it's still a very attractive part of the market for us. 
uh, and um, it's an area where we're, we're very happy to continue to operate. So in terms of pricing, you're asking about pricing and, and rental yields. So, so rental yields, uh, rental levels rather, uh, this is this is very much um, linked more to the wider market rather than to um, GP surgeries. It's a different mechanism. It's effectively an open market mechanism and it's a negotiated rent on entry. Uh, we tend to have indexation on these leases. So clearly the rent review mechanism is non-controversial. It is a, it is a calculation. So that means there isn't any uh, complicated reading across to other sectors. And in terms of the level of returns, um, then pr pricing on these assets has been um, slightly um, slightly a a ahead for us. So, so slightly better returns for us than core NHS assets and GP services probably because it reflects a slightly a slightly higher risk though the funding for ramsey is almost all um uh, is almost all nhs anyway so effectively you do have a quasi nhs backing behind behind the covenant the next question is is how is the pharmacy segment faring do you have plans to potentially sell these assets and recycle capital into development acquisitions um really good question so yes the so pharmacy is really interesting the market has changed quite fundamentally so Pharmacy um, has um, used to be absolutely central to every single development we produced. It would be a significant contributor to the financial returns up front because the pharmacy opera would pay a significant premium, hundreds of thousands of pounds to be in a medical center because they saw that as the, the number one destination for, for pharmacy. Still is very desirable, but those premiums are no more. So it's, it's now a much less important part of uh, our overall return for a scheme. They tend to be now even smaller, so they're getting smaller. Uh, we're not seeing material rental growth in that sector anymore, so so the rental levels are not are not growing significantly. So it's becoming a much much smaller part of our overall uh, of our overall proposition. Um, would we like to sell them? It's very hard because they're they're, they're integrated within our existing centres, um, so we wouldn't really want to carve up because effectively you'd have to you'd have to sell off part of our part of our building. So. I mean, this building here, Station Medical Center, for example, you can't quite see, but just to the left, the corner there is actually going to be, is, is a pharmacy unit. It's right in the building. So that's really quite challenging to sell that off. Um, uh, but obviously if we could, then we would be able to recycle the capital, but it's not, it's not, not really practical. Now, because there are so many other people asking questions, I will pause there on Eduardo's. We can come back perhaps to, um, he's, I think he's got three further questions there, which we can come back to perhaps. But I think it's only fair to, to move on to the next question. So the next question is from Michael. Uh, what is your view on expansion outside the UK, either directly or through partnership? Um, so in terms of uh, in terms of other geographies, um, we have uh, we obviously consider this all the time. Um, you know, clearly international expansion is a, is an obvious possible route for us for to continue to our growth trajectory. We have evaluated a number of markets. Um, there's only really one market that we've given any really serious in-depth uh, thought to, and that's Ireland. Um, that reflects the fact that it's got a very similar um, setup to uh, to the UK in terms of dynamics. It's got an aging population. It's got a growing population. But it's also got a very similar dynamic in that it's got very poor quality primary care infrastructure. And they're trying to alleviate, alleviate rather, the pressure on the hospitals so they are investing money in primary care so there's a lot of fundamentals there that are very similar um you don't have um you, you also tend to lease directly um to um, the hsc which is the equivalent of the of, of the nhs and, and the doctors tend to take a much smaller space and it provides a broader range of community services so it's definitely an interesting market the thing that's held us back and holds us back really is is just need to be sure that it's a scalable market because there isn't really any point in, in entering an international geography, set all the setup costs, the legal, professional, and everything else, currency and all of that, unless we have confidence that there's a, a material opportunity. So um, so we continue to monitor that and obviously we'll update the market in due course you know, if, if our position changes. So the next question is from David. Uh, and it is uh, actually there's two questions in here. So the first one is how are staffing issues affecting matters going forward? And then the second one is about um, likely increases in interest rates and how will that affect us going forward? I, I, maybe I'll ask Jane to cover that second part about interest rates and our outlook um, and, and how we protect ourselves from that. And that first one, staffing issues. So this is 
This is a really pertinent question because really the, this is one of the big issues that the NHS is facing at the moment is, is workforce. So we're seeing uh, an increasing number of GPs retiring early. The government had a really ambitious target, if you remember, for hiring 6,000 new GPs uh, within five years. I think we're, we're pretty much at the end of that five years and actually the number of GPs has gone down. So that's not gone terribly well. So there is undoubtedly a, a staffing uh, shortfall. Um, in terms of the direct impact on our business to date, it's been very limited. Um, clearly, it is a problem for the system as a whole. And what we're finding is some of the smaller practices are really struggling to, um, to remain open and really struggling to recruit. And, and we are seeing an increasing number of smaller practices closing. We haven't seen that in our portfolio at all. It's something we continue to monitor very closely. Where we have had um, issues with um, practices because of, of staffing, Generally, what we found is the NHS is really keen to keep these practices open. They're absolutely essential to the um, to the infrastructure of, of the local community and, and the health economy. And they do everything in their power to keep them open. And, and if the doctors um, wish to stop uh, practicing because they're retiring, and it's happened to us in a handful of cases, the, the local NHS teams have stepped in, taken over the lease, and they brought in new doc doctors to run those services because our types of building by definition, are going to be absolutely crucial for that for that local environment. Now, perhaps I'll pass to Jane to, to cover off the interest rate risk and in our approach. Yeah, thanks, Jonathan. Um, so if we actually looked, uh, we take the slide I showed you earlier in terms of our average cost of interest is now 2.3%, but we did a bond in the summer at 1.625%. Uh, and we still have some cash from the bond as well as the cash from our uh, our equity raise, which will be coming in next week. So we've got plenty of firepower to fulfill uh, the pipeline that we have uh, and the use of proceeds and beyond. So we are largely protected against that in the short to medium term. But I would also note that the margins on our debt are some of the lowest in the industry. So again, uh, the popularity of our sustainability strategy and our A minus credit rating stands us in good stead moving forward to still secure uh, debt at attractive rates, uh, given the last one is a 1.625, last year was one and a half, and on average rate is 2.3%. Is so we have, a, we have a long way to go, we think, before it starts to cause us an issue. But, uh, but as I said, we've got plenty of cash resources available to us to fulfil the immediate pipelines and beyond uh, at the moment. Great. Thanks, Jane. So next question is from George and is in relation to developments. And again, Jane, I might ask you to come back on this one if that's OK. So it's George and it says regarding developments, what is your target development yield and what is your target EPC? Yep, no problem. So if we take our development yields, we talk about forward funds and we talk about our in-house developments. So a brand new asset, 21 year lease, uh, best asset in its in its its location. Um, the pricing on that would be somewhere probably around 4%, maybe a, a little bit more. Um, and so if we're doing this uh, as a forward fund, we will get about 10 to 15 basis points betterment on that yield because it's an incredibly competitive market with us and, and the other competitors we've mentioned. Um, however, if we were to develop it ourselves, then we can capture up to 100 basis points betterment on, on that yield. So, for example, in that instance, if we are uh, a if the market is at 4%, then we will be developing at 5%. So you can see that's very good business for us. In terms of the, uh, uh, and sorry, and just to be clear, uh, we, we don't actually uh, publish the split, but uh, it, uh, probably around 50 50 is, is, is a suitable measure in terms of what's forward funded and what's, um, what's uh, in house development. In terms of our targeted EPC rating, we have set a definitive target to get the whole portfolio up to an EPC B or above uh, by 2026. 30% of our portfolio is already at this level and our new developments are, are, are all at, at A's or BRIAM at very good or better. Um, however, uh, we have a full programme of works for the remainder of the portfolio. But just to be clear, 50% of the portfolio is at a C. So it doesn't take a huge amount of capital spend on that asset. Uh, things like LED lighting, maybe some insulation work or PV panels on the roof, et cetera, new boiler to bring that asset up to a B or, or an A. And that's a whole program that will be working on small uh, uh, areas of, of development and, and uh, refurbishment over uh, over the next five years to, to bring those assets up to uh, to our target of a B. And in terms of cost on that, 
we're estimating somewhere in the region of 25 to 30 million pounds. However, we can also uh, wrap some of those uh, works into a regear of an existing lease. Therefore, we will capture a valuation uplift as we uh, as we make that expenditure on some of those assets. Great. Thank, thank you very much, Jane. So the next question is uh, in relation to developments and about what is our current market share in projects that we're winning on the development space. So, um, so very difficult to be precise because there isn't really exact market data, but the sort of sort of sort of feedback I get from the team about what opportunities that they're, they're aware um, they're aware that we haven't won. Historically, we were running at about twenty five to a thirty three percent. So one in four, one in three projects we used to win. Now, so in the last two years, we've then acquired GPI, we've acquired Apollo, and we've increased the team. Uh, and the team are now telling me that they that we're now we're now just we're now better than half. So so one in two or slightly better, uh, we're now securing. Uh, so that hopefully gives you an idea of, of our approximate. It has to be approximate because there isn't empirical data, unfortunately, for that. But hopefully that's helpful. Um, the next question is about the split between in-house and, and forward fund, but actually um, J Jane just referenced that before, so uh, had already answered that. So if you think about it as a broadly 50-50 split, then that then that's um, that's the right way of thinking about both the current pipeline and, and approximately going forward. Uh, then moving on to the next question, it's from Matthew, and it's about approximately how long will it take to achieve the circa 160 million rent on, on slide 12. So that's the pro forma uh, rental growth. So maybe I'll, I'll ask Jane to just take you through that one. Yep, so uh, if we uh, refer back to that slide, you'll, uh, you'll remember it's each of our pipelines that we knew as at the 30th of September, and each of them will come through at different times. So um, acquisitions will be in the next three to six months. Rent reviews and asset enhancements will be anywhere from now to the next uh, about 18 months to two years. And the de development pipeline immediate uh, on site will be in the next 12 to 18 months. The immediate will start to deliver probably in the next 18 months to three years, dependent on when they get on site. And the extended will be on that. So all of that, you're probably looking, we don't, it, you're probably looking at four to five years in in total however it's worth noting that that is just what we knew about in the business at the 30th of september we continue to add to that so we'll be continuing to add to the acquisition pipeline we will be continuing to do more rent reviews and asset enhancement and we will be continuing to add to our development pipeline but that's just a snapshot of a, of, of a moment in time and, and what that would lead to fantastic thanks jane so the next question is from Nick. Uh, do you see Zoom appointments taking over from phone appointments? And if so, what extra space is needed for this? Now, it's a, it's a really good question. So actually what's happened in practice, people talk about digital, so-called digital consultations. But the, but the reality is doctors are actually not that keen on the video consultation generally. So it has predominantly been telephone calls. Now, you know, is there scope for, for that telephone call mix to move into, into um, virtual consultations? Uh, absolutely. Um, in terms of space now, interestingly, we have, we have modified one of our practices where we took out two consulting rooms and replaced them with eight um, soundproofed um, video call uh, booths. That, that, that's easily done. It doesn't really need a great, um, a great amount of additional space. And in fact, many of the um, uh, you know, video consultations can be done from the existing desks in the existing consulting rooms. So it doesn't really involve significant adjustments or modifications to the building. So it's not a big capex requirement. And our buildings are really able to adapt to that uh, as required, really. Um, so next question is from David, um, and it's to do with use of funds uh, and application to debt. So Jane, I might ask you to come back on this one. So the question is, Will any of the current fundraising be used to clear down debt uh, or many or are many of the loans on a fixed interest basis? And are you happy to maintain them? So in, in short, no, we won't be using any any funds to clear down debt. We've we've uh, we've done all of our work on our debt on the last few years. We're very happy. As I say, the average uh, maturity is eight and a half years. Um, our next uh, event will be in 2024 with our evolving credit facility and following that our fixed rate debt. Um, will be in 2025. Uh, all of our loans are 3% or under, uh, and like I say, they're long-term fixed rates. So, so we won't be uh, we won't be making any changes at this time. We're very happy. Great, thanks, Jane. Right. So, next question is from David. So, this is quite a, a challenging one. 
Um, so you said you're in a competitive active marketplace. Do you read this as easier to expand by takeovers, mergers? And if so, do you see yourself as being hunted or the hunter? Well, um, well, that's a very difficult question to answer, David. So I guess the first thing to say is in terms of large scale portfolios, you know, we have been incredibly acquisitive of, of buying those up. You call that M&A, if you like, because we've been buying businesses. There are very, very few left. So what's left to go for um, really are lots of small scale opportunities in terms of individual sites, generally a handful of port very small portfolios. Then there's, there's a, there is a large um, a couple of large portfolios which we're very interested in and we'll continue to pursue them. And then there's the two listed players. So then, you know, clearly, you know, you know, you know that's, um, you know, M&A in the listed space is always quite complex uh, and we both trade on significant premium to net asset value so we've both got very happy shareholders so it's difficult to uh, to see see the motivation for that but clearly you you never know what 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 the market might throw at us so i would say i would look more to uh, grow through um you know serial acquisitions we've developed a really effective machinery for generating these deals and this development pipeline so i probably if i was you i think that's a more likely source of growth than m a but obviously m a is a, 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 a impossible to predict so the next question is from andrew and it's uh how do you development opportunities in london compare with the rest of the country uh, poorly is the is the is the short answer so the problem here andrew is because we operate on a cost plus basis with the nhs the cost of land in London is so disproportionately high that it makes the rents almost unaffordable for the NHS. So what's happened over the last 20 years is that the NHS has, has deferred and have said, no, we're not going to fund that development because we don't want to pay that rent. So unfortunately, London has the worst quality primary care estate of anywhere in the country by quite some way. Um, and the only way to fix that really is further investment and the NHS being willing to take on board some of those higher costs. Um, so watch this space. Obviously, we'd be delighted to deliver those schemes. So that we've got no issue with working in London uh, and it would generate some, some very high rental levels and would be very supportive of some of our other London assets. So we'd be delighted to do more projects in London, uh, but it's uh, it's just very challenging to do so. So maybe just uh, for the final question, if we go back to um, Eduardo's uh, list of questions um, and um, go back to where, where we were, um, his next question was to do with considering NHS funding issues, do you have a sense if there is an appetite from the NHS to sell off some of their real estate ownership? Really interesting question. So about five years ago, there was a rumor in the market that the NHS was looking to put a billion pound portfolio in the market precisely for the reason that you've highlighted to take that billion pounds and invest it in brand new in, in investing in new estate and creating and improving the estate certainly that would make some 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 sense but um i think in the end that was that was stopped um by the treasury because they they didn't um they didn't see the financial merit in in that in that transaction because the government effectively can borrow at the rates of gilts which is you know very low uh, and if we were to if we were to buy their assets we'd be looking for a yield of, of four and a half percent or so so that doesn't didn't didn't make economic logic to the treasury in their opinion so could that come back of course it's possible um there is some logic to them selling off assets and specifically in the Naylor report it specifically recommended that in london they should sell off some of their excess land etc precisely to answer the question we just had which is to create the funding to make the economics work on, on that really important investment in, in the London uh, primary care market, which is required. So hopefully that um, that that helps answer that question. Now I know um, we uh, unfortunately we're now um, we're now coming to the end of the um, of the discussion. So perhaps we can close the Q and A there. That's great. Jonathan, Jane, thank you very much indeed for being so generous with your time and taking all the questions on. Perfect timing as well as we come up to the hour. Um, Jonathan, perhaps um, I know that investor feedback is important to you and I'll shortly redirect investors uh, to provide you with their thoughts and expectations. But I guess before doing so, if I could just ask you for a few closing comments just to wrap up with, and then I will redirect investors uh, for their thoughts and expectations. Fantastic. So first of all, say thank you for all the really, really insightful uh, questions, wide ranging across, you know, so many different topics and themes. Really interesting. I'm delighted 
to have this opportunity to share our thoughts with you. And hopefully uh, you've taken away with a real sense of progress in your business and how, you know, how we've got a fantastic business that's got fantastic prospects and really ready to meet those demands and those challenges that the NHS needs to create that extra capacity. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for listening and uh, on all the excellent questions. That's great. Jonathan, Jane, thank you once again for updating investors this afternoon. Can I please ask investors not to close this session as we'll now automatically redirect you for the order in order that you can provide your thoughts and expectations back to the management team. This will only take a few moments to complete, but I'm sure will be greatly valued by the company. On behalf of the management team of Ashura PLC, we'd like to thank you for attending today's presentation. That now concludes today's session. Good afternoon and have a very good weekend.